This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 125, Hazel Homan, Part 2. Last week, I told you the story of three-year-old Hazel Homan, whose brain was fatally injured while she was in the care of her father's girlfriend, Cammie Dixon. This episode features two special guests— First, you'll hear my conversation with Stephanie D., the jury foreperson at Cammie's murder trial, who is the first juror I've spoken to on the podcast and who had a very valuable perspective of the case. Next, you'll hear from Ashley Barnes, Hazel's aunt and the sister of Hazel's father, Brandon Homan. Ashley has been the de facto family spokesperson since Hazel's death, and she told me all about the sweet little girl her family cherishes to this day, whose memory they will never allow to fade. This is part two of the heartbreaking story of Hazel Homan. Because I'm recording this episode at the same time as last week's, no patron shout-outs today. Instead, I'll jump right in. Here's my conversation with Jury 4 person Stephanie D. Thank you so much for joining me, Stephanie. Of course, yeah. So you were the foreman on the jury, and that means you were in court for, was it three full months? Yeah, just about. It was, uh, I don't know the exact start date, but I know it went through June 30th, so I think it was like the middle of April. And so I actually count the six weeks of jury selection, too. So (laughs) I always tell people four months. Wow, that is pretty lengthy. And I guess it was the longest criminal trial in your county's history. Yeah, I learned that after the fact, actually. You told me you've never been on a jury before. How prepared did you feel for all of that? So not at all. <laughs> they uh, like during our downtime, like when we get dismissed for objections that we had to get ejected for or whatever, that was something we talked about quite often is what legal definitions do we need to keep in mind? Like what do these different objections mean when they don't want us to consider something and the judge says to strike it? I actually asked the judge after the fact why don't you repeat what you don't want us to hear? And I mean, it makes logical sense. They don't want to say it a second time to imprint it even further, but sometimes things roll along in court before the objection comes up. So you have two questions between that objection and the actual like saying to strike that. So it's kind of difficult to figure out exactly what is going on at times. So yeah, they should definitely give juries a little bit more intro than that nice video (laughs) that they do at the start. So Yeah, it sounds like it. you'd have to take pretty copious notes to be able to keep track of everything you're allowed to consider and and what you're not. Yes, definitely. I went through four notebooks uh, total. So like those legal pads and actually another juror, she went through seven and a half. So we're just writing everything down because you never know what you're going to get back. Are you going to get the whole testimony? Are you going to have a transcript of it? Are you going to replay it? Like we don't know the rules until they dismiss us for deliberation. So we assumed nothing would be included. (laughs) So yeah, a lot of writing. And it sounds like a lot of what certain parties wanted submitted as evidence was not allowed into the trial. You know, I am very interested to hear from down the road as things come out with different news articles and podcasts covering the trial. I'm interested to hear what we didn't hear during those objections and getting rid of evidence and all that, because I know that there were pieces of evidence we wanted to look at during deliberations that were just not there because they gave us like a huge wheelie container with file folders with each evidence number marked. So I think there was, I want to say almost 500. So we had a bunch of bins to go through. And then sometimes we'd go to reference that one particular piece of evidence 
evidence from our notes and it wasn't there. So that was something that was definitely frustrating during deliberations is, you know, we didn't take perfect notes of a doctor's testimony or the exact time of something and then we don't have it to reference. So that was definitely not a great part is that they didn't tell us ahead of time, like, hey, take good notes on this witness because you're not going to have the report that we're talking about during their testimony. I know that the defense had a ton of people they wanted to call for witnesses and things they wanted to introduce, but said they weren't able to. I don't know how pertinent it all was, but, you know, apparently not enough that the judge allowed it in. So it's very hard to make a decision, I imagine, without knowing the full picture. Yeah. And it's always funny because there's all these questions that came up during deliberations. Like we wanted to know why certain people that were referenced many times weren't called or, you know, what certain criminal histories were that were referenced in a general way, but we didn't hear about the specifics. And I don't know which side would have necessarily benefited or had a detriment from any particular witness, but it was definitely frustrating to not have all of that at your fingertips because it's like, you know, there's a whole big story and you know, there's so much more to it but we just didn't get into the weeds of some of that story and it leaves questions. And as you know, when you're a juror, you do the best that you can with what they give you. And that's the story from each side. Which story do you believe more and why? And that's it. There was a lot of things that were alluded to that were like, I want to research that after this is over. Have you seen anything in the news coverage at all that's uh, surprised you or that you didn't learn about during trial? Yes. To answer your question short, but the long answer is yes. So there was one particular photo. The CSI from the Bellingham Police Department was testifying. They're questioning him. Both sides questioned him about all of the, I think, 200 or so photographs of her apartment. The original scene of Hazel's choking incident or apparent choking incident and his photographs, there was one particular photograph in the bathroom where the prosecution didn't originally say anything. And then the defense took the witness and then it was the prosecution's turn one more time. And they pulled this one photo out of all 200. And it was a photo of the bathroom where Cammie had said that Hazel had been in the shower and she'd wrapped her up in this loving way or whatever. But their picture was of the sink. And it was really important to us because Cammie had testified that there was nobody in the apartment because she was the only one that really went to that apartment. It was her own. She kept as a backup for her independence. And apparently no one had been in there. But then that sink actually had drug paraphernalia of some kind. Some It was a, definitely a, like a tube, a glass tube. It looked like what you'd smoke crack with or maybe heroin because it was just a glass, a long glass pipe. There's residue all throughout the inside and there was no kind of end to it. So it was definitely like a straw style thing. And it was on the counter and it was very obviously drug paraphernalia. And there was an objection. Then no one brought it up again. We didn't hear about it again. And it was very like, okay, well, the judge didn't strike that photo and we had the photo in evidence, but it was definitely like interesting. So to go back to your question, after the fact, many of, our jur of the jurors have kept in touch and we've been sending each other things that we found. And somebody pulled background records and apparently there was a long history of drug use from Cami that she uh, had a big issue with heroin, which I can't imagine how difficult that would be on someone and their psyche and everything. But seeing that immediately connected, a lot of us were like, I bet that's exactly what that was. So there's things that have come out since then that were like, hmm, they didn't talk about this, but we kind of knew, but they didn't tell us. So, you know, who knows if the photograph was left in on purpose and nobody brought it up until during court. But yeah, it was very suspicious. <laughs> That's really interesting. It almost feels like it had to have been left in there on purpose for you to make your own inference. Yeah, that's what we thought. Who knows? But the vibe that I got was maybe that the defense didn't notice somehow because their counter was kind of textured in a way where you might not notice it. When the prosecution zoomed in in the photograph, you could see it very clearly, but in the zoomed out version, you couldn't really see it. So we kind of thought maybe it was a, a gotcha moment or something like that. Did you have to see some things that, that were very you know, difficult to see? Yes, it was horrible. And the kind of interesting thing is that some of the stuff that was horrible, so we did see autopsy photos, which that was horrible to see a sweet little three-year-old little baby like that. But the thing that actually shook me the most, um, and I actually talked to Ashley Hazel's aunt about this because her and I have kind of kept in touch and I met up with her after sentencing. 
one of the things I saw that all of us jurors then talked about during deliberations, how upsetting it was, um, it wasn't anything graphic. It was a video of Hazel standing in the hallway and the defendant was behind the camera uh, filming with her phone, I think. The defendant is off camera talking to Hazel, who's on camera. The video is about two minutes long and it's the defendant saying, Hazel, who's coming? Who's coming to see you? Kind of questioning her in this happy, like kind of prodding her to the answer kind of way. And Hazel is standing there and it's early morning. She's in pajamas or something. And you can see she's like, oh, uh, I don't I don't know. And she doesn't know the answer. And so Cami continues to say, who's coming? I just told you, we just talked about this. Who's coming? And as the back and forth continues, Hazel doesn't have the answer. She doesn't know. And you can kind of see her body language starting to tighten up. Like her hand starts to press against her leg and her arms get kind of rigid. There's a nervousness in her voice. And oh my God, it's so upsetting just because you can see how scared this little kid is of not having the answer. And then the defendant's tone of her voice off camera, Kami says, she's starting to get more and more frustrated that Hazel won't answer the question. And she goes, Hazel, we just talked about this. Are you fucking kidding me? Come on. I just told you. And she starts to get so short and angry. And it's so upsetting to see this little kid being talked to like that. And that was definitely one of the most difficult things of everything to see. After that day, I went to my car and I just sat and cried because it was so sad to see this sweet little girl. She doesn't know. She's three. You could just hear how mean it was. It was so cruel. So that was definitely, uh, ironically, it was not graphic. It was just the meanness of that one video. There was a bunch of other videos and voice notes of the defendant being very cruel, but that was the one directed at Hazel that we saw that was just so sad. Had she posted that on social media or was that just from her phone? I believe it was just, Cammie had just sent it to Brandon. So she had not posted it on social media, but I think the intent originally was to post it on social media because Cammie was very involved on Facebook. She did a lot of posting. And a lot of posting that looked like basically window dressing. Look at what a wonderful parent I am. And yep. It's, yep. it's like a peek behind the curtain when you see something like that video. And it shows you when the doors close, things are different. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's interesting, too, because Cammie's Facebook is public. And I don't know how much of it's public. I'm not friends with her on there. So I can't, I don't know if it's only select things I can see, but I can say as just a general member of the public, when I look her name up on Facebook, I'm able to see many of the photos that were submitted into evidence by the defense that are happy times, them on a boat, them on family vacations, them playing, whatever. But it's interesting to then know the timeline and the injuries that many, many doctors testified to being present at that time. And then seeing the reality that Cammie's posting versus the actual reality from a doctor's standpoint and what we know that timeline to be. And it's just crazy. Just it really makes you kind of jaded about <laughs> what else is out there in the world from people in my own sphere. Exactly. It really makes you wonder. And that's a big part of the reason why I do this to raise awareness of what the signs might be that people wouldn't even think to notice, you know, because most of us wouldn't have a clue what we're looking for. If it's not like a black eye or missing tooth, then, then how would we know? But just telling so many of these stories, it starts to become a theme, the things you can watch for. Oh, yeah, I imagine you start to see trends. Exactly. A lot of these people do get out there on social media and just make themselves look like the most wonderful, loving parents. And then after the fact, it's just sickening. Yeah. The way you put it is really good window dressing. That's exactly what it seems like. You know, it looks great from the outside. And then you just put your hand up to the window and it's like, oh, this kid has bruises and broken bones. Like it, it's so sad because she was failed by CPS. They had the opportunity. And she, I think Hazel's case got passed through. I believe it was three or maybe four people. I don't remember the exact number now, but there's three or four different people, representatives from that agency that her case got passed through and they were checking boxes saying, yes, go for it because the dad had completed treatment and now he's showing interest in having his kid back. And apparently Washington's a big reunification state that wants the parents to have the child. When the last representative, I forget her name, but when she got up on the stand, it was moving. It's like you're angry with her as like she failed this kid and now she's on the stand testifying about her murder. But at the same time, it's like you could see how much that person, that woman was so upset. They showed a picture of Hazel's burned hand that that woman had taken 
it looked like she was going to throw up and she started crying and it was extremely moving because you just know in her core, she must feel so bad, but it didn't change anything. They are human beings. And of course, they're going to make mistakes. Absolutely. It's, it's when it's a systemic problem that it really starts to seem like something needs to change, especially the reunification thing, which unfortunately seems to be the majority of states. Even when it's obvious that kids shouldn't be going back to that home, mm-hmm. you know, one person from Washington that I saw on a forum, I can't remember which forum it was now, but said, well, we're saving the state money by reunifying these families because it costs too much to foster them. Oof. The fact that a child's Ugh. life can be reduced to a dollar sign is so awful. Yeah. I mean, that's life in general, right? That's how the government works with insurance and True. everybody. It all comes down to money. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good point. I know there's got to be a way that positive change can be made, but it seems so daunting sometimes. Yeah. Like, what's the answer? Every system needs an overhaul and every system needs to get the bloat taken out of it. But like, where do you begin and how do you start to assess those things? I just can't imagine just the idea alone. It sounds daunting. I definitely feel bad for the people that are stuck in the system and trying their hardest to do the right thing. Because at some point, things will slip through the cracks, no matter how hard you try for whatever particular case, something will slip through the cracks because you can't have your eyes on everything. So I definitely felt bad for that woman that testified. Yeah, I did see that one photo of her poor little hand. It was just so horrific. And it's sickening. Just knowing what happened to her and her poor little eye and and all the other things. Yeah, when they kind of went through the, like, the, I mean, essentially, I guess, a checklist of all her different injuries over the course of about five months. And she had regular medical care before that. This was something that was a big decision maker for us in the deliberations room was the timeline. So the way that we got to homicide by abuse and finding her guilty was the fact that there was a withholding of medical care. And frankly, that is torture. So I'm not sure if you saw the news article about the definition of torture being something that we didn't get when we questioned the judge. And that was why the defense wanted to have a retrial because we didn't get that. And so we didn't get the definition. So then we had to kind of come up with what we believe torture to be. And withholding medical care for that many injuries, we defined as torture. And over the timeline, uh, there was enough there that we were able to say, you know what, this is a pattern of abuse or torture. So the word or torture was a big piece for us. So. Well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, withholding medical care causes undue pain and suffering, and and that's basically the definition of torture, I would think, for anyone. Yeah, that was essentially how we defined it was, if I had burned my hands, you know, you put yourself in the other person's shoes and you're like, I broke my fingertip one time many years ago, and that hurt really bad. And it was just my fingertip. And I mean, yeah, there's a lot of nerves. It's a finger, but that's not an arm. That's not a knee. That's not my spine. And I can't imagine, especially being a little kid and not knowing what that pain is from or having a reason what might have happened. And especially in five months, your bones don't heal that quickly. So you're still going to have residual pain from one when the other one happens. And we didn't get any sort of timeline definition. No medical expert was willing to give an actual date. Um, but they gave a range between two and six weeks old. They couldn't say exactly for each one of those bone breaks. And there was some healing in one of her finger bones that looked like it had healed. And there was some discussion about whether it was actually a break or not. But long story short, nobody disputed the fact that she had a broken elbow and a broken tibia, I believe, and then um, a bunch of broken vertebrae. And for a little child to be not cared for alone for those things... And then also to have her hand burn that was so extensive, like almost up to her wrist, that her whole entire hand, that is just unspeakable. So that was a huge piece for us during deliberations too, was like each one of those alone, not getting medical care, but as a group in such a short span of time, very suspicious. It did not make any sense to us. And that was a big point of discussion was this doesn't add up. And the, just the pain that she had to have been in and not knowing why or what caused it or or that she should be taken to the doctor and wasn't, you know, she's so little and she could barely talk yet. And it's interesting, the defense tried to bring up what if it was the defendant's five-year-old son 
who had inflicted some of these injuries. That was one of the things they tried to go with. And none of us bought that. It just wouldn't make sense. Like, yeah, so that that kid was a rough player. And that was a well-established theme that they asked every everybody who knew that kid. He was a rough player, but it just wouldn't make sense that she would have that many injuries from a five-year-old. It didn't look like he was that much bigger than her. And, and kids have pretty resilient bones, so to break them. And the interesting thing was, so they, they leaned really heavily into, she was vitamin D deficient. And we know that because of her blood work that was postmortem. So then very interestingly, one of our jurors was actually a lab tech and she was a lab tech manager. I forget her exact title, but she was essentially the main person who was in charge of checking all the instruments, doing all the calibration, knowing what the ranges were for the various types of tests that they ran in her facility. It was human testing. So she worked for a reputable big company up here. So when those people came up on the stand, I had already known that. And those blood testing company reps had come up on the stand relatively late in the trial. And so I knew that about her. And as soon as they got up on the stand, I was like, here we go. She's going to have so much to say about this because she knows everything that they're talking about. She can understand their lingo. And one of the things that she pointed out, which was so wonderful to have her on there, was there was no tracking of chain of custody. So on the actual piece of paper that we got showing the results, there was no name. There was just a code and we didn't get anything to say, oh, that was this code is Hazel's. Um, the other thing was the um, blood testing company rep testified the actual sample was leaking. So it was all over the place inside of the container that they got it from. And outside of that, it was at room temperature and he had no idea the history of the sample and vitamin D and many other vitamins degrade over time based on the temperature of the blood. And it was over a year old. <laughs> so when they tried to say it was vitamin deficient and off the charts, it was so low vitamin D deficient. It was like, well, obviously it was room temperature and open. That's ridiculous. It was outrageous that they even tried that. Frankly, all of us were like, uh huh, bullshit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, my jaw is just hanging open. Like, I can't. It wasn't actually evidence. What I understand happened, and I, I could be wrong here, but um, it, the sample was taken by the medical examiner's office and it was kept in a refrigerator. I don't remember all the ins and outs of how they actually kept it, but I believe that she, the medical examiner, Dr. Yard, testified about all of the stuff that they did with her samples. And they, I remember that she testified that they kept it and it was logged and there was chain of custody there. However, I believe, if I remember right, that there was a second lab that came in and took some of the samples from the King County Medical Examiner. And it was a private testing company that the defense had hired. And they were the ones that didn't have any of the information necessary to kind of keep everything above board. And they also didn't test on any of the samples on the lab testing wasn't done on reputable machines. And that was something that our juror was able to talk to us about and say, this is why this CLIA certification is so important because otherwise it's not reputable basically without the certification. So, so they got the results they wanted and yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's kind of the vibe that we got. So, and I was reading today about how they paid $30,000 for the forensic pathologist out of Texas. And yeah. of course he's going to testify to what you want him to. Yeah. Right. We definitely didn't find him to be very trustworthy either. He came in with his fancy suit and he was talking about how he was going to miss his flight if the testimony went over too long because he was taking his family on this vacation. And it was like, come on, dude. <laughs> Sounds like a used car salesman. Yeah, he was, uh, he had a smile that would go a hundred miles. Like he was very handsome and he looked like he was very magnetic type of personality, but on the stand, it just rubbed us all the wrong way and felt kind of sleazy a little bit because of course he's going to testify how they want. Yeah. And it sounds like he had a lot of contradictory testimony as well. You can't attribute that to accidental or inflicted injury. But yeah, these are all accidental, though. Yeah, there was a lot of that. And then one of the other things that he was kind of wishy-washy about was um, talking about the staining of one of the Dura layers and how some of the brown staining, because it was dark brown, he knew it was older and how this other piece was light red. And so it was obviously fresh. But then when questioned by the prosecution, he was kind of backtracking a little bit to say, oh, well, the colors don't always say exactly what we think they are, because sometimes based on the placement of the blood and the supply and different things and leaking and 
So he was a little bit wishy-washy about this uh, existing hemorrhage in, I think, the base of her brain. I forget exactly, but that was another thing that he kept kind of going back and forth a little bit. He kind of would carve his answer for the defense as they needed it. But yeah, we were not as impressed with that guy. <laughs> That's probably a big part of the reason I would think the verdict came out the way it did. Yeah, there was a number of big reasons for it. The main one, frankly, being there were so many very, very reputable, well-established extremely educated medical personnel that came up to the stand. They had seen subdural hemorrhages many times and I haven't. So I'm trusting person after person after person that's telling me their expert testimony. And that's actually something that they, uh, that we did during deliberations was we made, made uh, like a spreadsheet. Essentially we made a whole grid on this giant piece of paper and Every person, so every medical testimony, expert opinion that we got, we went through, did they talk about this particular injury, this particular injury, each one? And we did kind of a, what did this doctor say uh, specifically and adding that all together because we did have a couple holdout jurors for the murder in the second degree. And that was a big piece of trying to look at the timeline because murder in the second degree was a very specific day really like a very short amount of time. And so that was one thing we were trying to put together is how many of these people believe this happened within that 24-ish hour period. That makes a lot of sense, actually, especially if you're taking the jury instructions to the letter, which you're supposed to do, obviously. And I'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of people were very upset by the, the deadlock on the murder charge. But if you don't have the precise evidence you need, then there's just going to be an appeal and it's just going to get overturned anyway. Yeah, that was a big consideration. There was a lot of frustration and a lot of um, back and forth. And in the jury room, we had established a hand raising system and that we only let one person talk at a time. And we were very, very respectful of that. And luckily, everybody but maybe one person pretty much, I guess maybe two, but for the most part, it was really just one juror really was not interested in keeping it professional in a way. Like it was, became a personal problem for this person and they didn't like everyone that didn't have the same opinion as them. And it's personal when someone has their heart in it, I can understand, but it definitely became very heated at times as a result. <laughs> but yeah, we were very respectful of the rules and taking each definition as exactly as possible and, you know, not talking when somebody left the room. We all were like, shush, 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 and shushed everyone to make sure no one was not in the conversation when someone had to go to the bathroom or whatever. So now just a quick break for a word from my sponsors. Who did you find to be the most compelling witness or, you know, if there was anybody who stood out to you, who were they? Wow. That's a question I haven't been asked before. <laughs> there were a lot. I, I think I mentioned this, but um, I've, I've uh, spoken a bit with and kept a little bit in touch with Hazel's aunt, Ashley. Her testimony was, she's very genuine and all of us really felt she was very genuine and like authentically upset, authentically frustrated with the system, authentically involved with Hazel. And it didn't come off as she, you know, she wasn't that involved. And now she's like playing a sob story. It did. We didn't get that at all from her. She was very, very moving to all of us. And Dr. Yarid, um, she was the King County medical examiner. She was on the stand. I believe it was for five or maybe six days. Oh my God. I can't imagine being on the stand that long and being examined, cross-examined, examined, cross-examined about the most small specifics. She was very impressive, not only because of how she was just so well-spoken and if she was anxious or frustrated or anything, you couldn't tell. She's very candid seeming. So she was wonderful. The other person that I was extremely impressed by was, I don't remember her first name. It was Dr. Marshall. She was uh, Seattle Children's, uh, maybe Harborview. I don't remember which hospital she specifically worked for, but she was a neurology specialist and I don't remember exactly what her title was, but yeah, she was wonderful. She was really well-spoken and she was, at least for me, she was a very convincing medical testimony as well. Oh, I should also mention, um, so Cammie's best friend, Autumn, she also testified pretty early on in the trial and she was up, I want to say for two or three days. And that was incredibly compelling in my experience too, because it's the best friend. She, they had been best friends since they were like 15 or something. 
And she testified talking about some of the things that the uh, prosecution had already been talking about. And her testimony really weighed heavily in our deliberations as well. And the interesting thing I thought about, and I actually talked to the prosecution later about it, was so Autumn had picked Hazel up from daycare one day. And um, Hazel, at some point, either like right before she got picked up or on the way home, Hazel had an accident. And so on the way back, Hazel couldn't really talk. She couldn't articulate that well. So as Autumn was driving her back to Autumn's house to watch her for the afternoon, um, Hazel had said something like, I had an accident or something where she couldn't, where Autumn was not really fully knowing exactly what Hazel was saying. And then at some point in the conversation on their drive home, Hazel said to Autumn, my cami hurt me, my cami mean to me. And she kind of oh, like pulled her shirt aside and showed a bruise that was on her like like near her clavicle shoulder area on like, her upper chest and autumn didn't really know what she meant or what she was talking about so she remembered the incident and didn't know specifically where to go with it because they were driving and she couldn't look at her that well and this was all in her testimony and then as soon as they got to autumn's house um autumn had been going back and forth with cammy just texting her like oh i picked her up blah 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 so then they get back to autumn's house and hazel and her walk in and Autumn realizes, oh, she had an accident, like at some point. And so Autumn texts Cami, like, "Hey, it looks like Hazel had an accident. What do you want me to do with her underwear? Do you want me to give her a shower? How do you deal with this at home so it's consistent?" And there was a series of voice notes that were played for us in court, and the voice notes were like literally each person talking in a recorded, like little short clip back and forth. And the conversation was essentially. Another thing that was extremely horrible to hear, but Cami said she shit her pants on purpose. She's trying to beef with me. She did this on purpose because she knows it's going to piss me off. Put her on the wall. A bunch of different horrible things. Hazel's three. Like, obviously, she didn't poop in her pants on purpose to make you angry. Like, it was horrible. So anyway, Autumn ends up putting Hazel in timeout on the wall, as they called it. And Hazel is punished right when she gets home. And so it had occurred to us in the jury room, like, I wonder if Hazel never tried to tell anybody else about the abuse going on because she tried to tell Autumn that day. And then in her little head, she got punished right after. So like that series of events might have connected that way for Hazel and she just never said anything again. All Hazel knew was this person that Cammie was really close with and that was around a lot in the very first couple months. In my mind, I was thinking, Autumn is around all the time because it's Cammie's best friend. So Hazel might have felt a little bit more comfortable telling this person that's a girl that she knows, that's friends around all the time and seems nice. Like maybe that's why she said that. And then I think it was in like mid or late July that that incident happened. And then she just never, never again. All of the, the workers and the people who came in and out of Hazel's life, did they testify that everything seemed fine? Uh, she seemed happy when we were around. Mm -hmm. Of course she did. She's not going to show it to just some random person showing up at the house. Yeah. And all their testimony was that Hazel was pretty shy, that it took her a lot to come out of her shell and that she wasn't, it wasn't for a while that they really saw her true personality and that she liked to dance and she was goofy, but they didn't say that she seemed like she was hurt or limping. But when you're three, maybe you aren't going to limp or maybe, you know, I know that there was a lot of times that people have said that they didn't see Hazel for a while. And there was private conversations between Cammy and Brandon that Cammy didn't want to bring Hazel out because quote unquote, it looks like she got beaten with a stick and things like that, where it's like, that's the background, you know, that's what's really going on that we have access to see because of all the text messages about it. So well, that's something I wanted to ask is what did you think of Brandon's testimony? Because I know he was up there for what, two days, maybe? Yeah, he was up there, I want to say for two days. You know, I, I'm sad for him because I think he authentically is sad. I think that he authentically is upset that this whole thing happened. But I, I kind of got the feeling that he still has Cammy's back that he doesn't really want to potentially see what happened. And he has a lot of reasons that Cammy seems like a really like, she seems really boisterous. Cammy really seems like she has a lot of personality and could be very compelling and very maybe unintentionally manipulative to get her way or do what she wants and have her kind of way. She seems like a leader. And Brandon kind of seems like he's happy to have her 
leading and he doesn't want to maybe see what po possibly happened that maybe Cammy lost her temper a few too many times. And I don't think that Cammy beat the crap out of Hazel necessarily. I think that if anything, she got backhanded because she was angry or, you know, she wasn't being as careful with Hazel because she was frustrated with her and Hazel fell. And then Cammy was like, well, you need to toughen up. That's kind of the feeling I got from the abuse. It wasn't so much, you know, intentional beatings. I think Cammy just wanted to toughen Hazel up and got too rough with her. It's very possible. It seems like she cared about her. I mean, she, she fought to get her into the house and, but it's hard to say, you know, what her reason was for doing that. Yeah. And then there was text messages, you know, about how much Cammy was excited for Hazel to come. And then not long after there was text messages about how she thinks it was a mistake and she wishes Hazel had never come. So who knows? We'll never know. And I honestly kind of going back to what I think really what happened is that I think that Cammy authentically that morning, I think Cammy really did not know what happened. I think she really thought she choked and she really was confused. And that's why she actually called 911 because every other time leading up to it, Cammy said she couldn't reach out because she wasn't allowed to as not the primary caretaker. But then the morning that this all happened, she called 911. She ran into a neighbor's house and called 911. So I think that morning she really didn't know. But I think other incidents, she probably did. And she was hiding it. And how was her testimony? What did, how did she come off on the stand? I noticed there was little things that were missing. There were a number of stories that we had heard leading up to her testimony that Hazel had fallen down the stairs on two separate occasions. And it was really upsetting to see. People talked about how Cammy told them what happened. And then when it came time for Cammy's testimony, it was very interesting that the first story about the stair fall in July or whatever, I think it was late July, Cammy had a lot of details. She had a lot of specifics. She used a lot of hand motions to describe things. And so that was something I, I you know, I, I believe that maybe Hazel really did fall down the stairs once and maybe it did really spook Cammy. However, the second stair fall that apparently happened a week before Hazel went to the hospital, the story that Cammy told was two sentences, three sentences, and it was her shaking her head and not being as vibrant of a storyteller as she had been with her other stories. And it just read to me like it was not true. Like she was just saying what I thought was a lie or some reason that would excuse what had happened and give a reason for the numerous broken bones, the bruises all over Hazel, blunt force trauma that they found. So that was definitely odd. The other thing that was sucked about her testimony was they kept calling her up and then bringing her back off the stand because there was witnesses that they were trying to fit in and fit Cammy's testimony in between that wait time so that we wouldn't continue to drag court on. So she was on the stand and off the stand, I want to say seven or eight times, but she was up and down. Oh, wow. So it was very segmented and you kind of lost the flow a little bit. So we had to kind of jump around in our notes and come back and go back. And so it definitely was not cohesive. And I just didn't really get the feeling that a lot of it was necessarily authentic. I think Cammy was probably scared. She's a younger woman and had two little kids and was pissed off. <laughs> That's kind of the feeling that I got. So, Well, it says a lot that at the sentencing, her own attorney said that the evidence paints a picture of a young woman who took on more than she could handle and who became overwhelmed, whose temper and frustration got the better of her, and who responded wrongly, resulting in a tragic loss of life. Wow. So that just reads as, okay, she's guilty, but here's why. And I mean, I understand it's a sentencing hearing, and sure, she's been found guilty, but still, it seems like he would have tried a little harder not to imply. Wow, I had not heard that. That is... That, that stood out. That is striking. <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. I We were in another room and they had us on a Zoom call listening and it was so difficult to hear. So I didn't get to hear that. I heard a bit of each person speaking, but not as, not as much specifics as I wanted. Wow. That's wild. It's hard to find much footage of the trial at all or the sentencing. There's just little tiny clips out here and there. It wasn't overall televised or published anywhere. So I have a few little audio clips to throw in the episode, but for the most part, it's not out there. And nobody really followed it on a day-to-day -day basis. 
I didn't realize that there was testimony from April all the way through June. It seemed like there was a gap in there. And I wondered why did testimony jump from April to June? What, what happened? But then I started picking through everything and it looked like, oh, they actually were testifying the whole time. Yeah, it was very long. And yeah, there was uh, 54 witnesses. And I'm surprised that there's not more out there. Um, I haven't really done a lot of Googling about it myself. I took a little bit of a break after to kind of settle back into normalcy because it's in a way, you know, it's weird being a juror because it's like you hear a little bit of the story from one person and then you hear a little bit more of the story, but there's other pieces or maybe not all of the story from person A and then person B tells a little more that's not really connected to person A. And then there's person C, D, you know, as you continue throughout hearing all this testimony, it's like you start to wonder, like, is this all of the story? Have I heard everything? Or is there someone else coming that I haven't heard everything yet? So you're kind of holding your breath, wondering, like, is that the whole story? It seems like a very challenging job to do. It is. Yeah, I was really surprised because since I was a kid, I watched, you know, Unsolved Mysteries and FBI Files when I was little. And, you know, growing up, I've always been really interested in hearing of people's stories about their involvement with horrible things. For some reason, that's always been a topic I'm interested in. But I've always been also very careful, which I actually, I wanted to say to you, I hadn't heard of your podcast before, but I only listen to very ethically good podcasts. Like I'm really careful not to listen to certain ones out there. And there's a lot that I don't think are respectful. And I just, I was going to say it, your podcast, like reading all the reviews and stuff, like you're doing an amazing podcast and an amazing service for people. And I'm really glad that there's people like you out there that can face that stuff because I can't. And it, it's got to be so difficult. So thank you for doing that. I just can't imagine the thank you. things that you have to hear about sometimes and people's experiences. So yeah. It's very hard to rationalize any of it. You know, the, the people say there's a reason for everything, but it doesn't feel that way when you're looking at this every single day. But it is so important to me that it's done in an empathetic way. These are real people. These are actual lives. You can't just look at it like this is a fascinating story for me to gawk at. Yeah. To involve myself in, you know, it's yeah. And I think I try to bring it down to that level. That's why it's so important to know who the child was, you know, what they loved and the silly things they did. And it's so important that they are remembered. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I was talking to Ashley a little bit before and she was saying like, she was a little bit on the fence, like how does she want to do this and whatever. And one of the things that we kind of were talking about was like, you know, the way that Hazel stays alive, the way that anybody who passes away stays alive is when people have stories to tell about them. And they stay alive in people's memories, right? That's what they always say. So like the more people who get to hear about Hazel, the you know, that's how she's staying alive. And, you know, frankly, I was just a juror in this case, but like, man, it has been touching. I, I don't have kids of my own, but Hazel seemed like such a sweetie pie. And every day during deliberations, we took a moment of silence and we would start our day by thinking about Hazel because all of this, we are heard a story from both sides and it's up to us to hope that we're going to make the right decision. And it was really, really hard. But at the end of the day, you're doing it to make sure that hopefully Hazel's being honored and that's the best that you can do. We did the best that we could with what we had. And it's just poor little girl at the center of the whole thing. It's so sad. So incredibly sad. I think that's amazing. Taking a moment of silence every morning. Yeah. We cried. There was a handful of times that, you know, we were strangers that kind of got to know each other in that jury room and throughout the whole trial that we got to chit chat. But like, it's so raw and it's such a weird human experience going through being on a jury, especially something so dark and so sad that, you know, the victim was truly, truly innocent. You know, in other trials, I'm not saying that other victims by any means are different, but like when it's a little kid, it really is different. And crying with a group of strangers that you just met, you know, a month ago and having these raw conversations about your own experiences and how it relates to this stuff and why you feel the way you feel. It's just very different. <laughs> it was very, very different than what I ever expected. I'm sure it's a, an experience that can't really be duplicated anywhere else. Yeah, I don't think so. I really don't. <laughs> You're kind of at the mercy of the law, you know, like showing up to court every day and doing your civic duty and you just kind of are along for this ride that you didn't sign up for. And, you know, you just are doing the best you can. <laughs> I'm glad that I was able to meet a lot of great people through the process. And Hazel, 
Hazel definitely is still in all of our hearts. Me and the other JIRA members, we chit chat every once in a while and kept in touch and send pictures. And it's been at least positive in that way for us. Well, thank you for doing your civic duty and sitting through all of that. It's got to be just so much that sits in your mind. And and I hope you're taking care of yourself because I know it can be a lot to process. Yeah, uh, you know, I am. I am very lucky. I have a wonderful husband who throughout this whole process, he took really good care of me and I would get home some days and I was visibly upset and he would just put his arms out, like bring it in, just like hug me and let me cry or just let me kind of just release the emotions of the day that you're holding in. Because some days you go home after hearing, you know, they call it at 4.30 or 5, whatever time. And the last thing you're hearing or seeing is an autopsy photo of a baby. And it's like, you know, I just have to go back to normal and, you know, catch up with work in the afternoon. And that's it. It's like jarring. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And it means a lot to me that you'd come on and and talk about your experience and help tell Hazel's story because that's the important thing. Absolutely. I hope I was a help in telling some of her story. And I wish her whole family, I wish them all the best because I just can't imagine having to try to, you know, move on and regroup, whatever that means, you know, after such a horrible thing. Now, I'll take a moment for a quick sponsor break, after which you'll hear my conversation with Hazel's aunt, Ashley Barnes. Hi, thank you so much for joining me, Ashley. Hi, thank you for reaching out to me and doing my niece's story. You're very welcome. I did not realize how much information there would be out there about Hazel's story. And uh, it's a very in-depth and there's a lot of details. And so I'm, I'm sure your head's been spinning over the last few years. Yeah, it definitely has. It's been really hard, but I think the hardest thing is like coming to the acceptance that we'll never know what happened that day in that apartment with Hazel and Cammy. I'm sure. Yeah. You just want answers and she's not going to give them. Mm-hmm. And if you don't come to that acceptance at the beginning, I just kept trying to look at pictures. I kept trying to think in my head what could have happened, just trying to find the answers, like literally driving myself insane. And I just had to stop. And I had to come to the fact that if I continue to do that and I don't just accept the fact that I may never know, it's just going to be 10 times worse. And Hazel wouldn't want that. No, of course. She wouldn't want you to drive yourself insane over it. Do you want to talk about your relationship with Hazel? Sure. Hazel was my niece. When she was born, I was there. Her mom ended up being rushed in. They had to do an emergency C-section on her. After that, they had brought Hazel out and we were able to see Hazel and her mom. And since that moment, I always called her my angel baby, but I never thought that she would really be an angel by three years old. She ended up staying with me and my mom a lot of the time. And my brother and his girlfriend had taken off for a while. Then my mom had Hazel pretty much almost since birth. And then After that, they came back and they actually took Hazel from us. And because it is a mother state here in Washington, they brought the cops to my house, actually. And I had to give Hazel back to them, even though they were not living a healthy lifestyle for Hazel. And that was really heartbreaking. And then my brother and the biological mother got into a DV situation and Hazel had to be removed from them. And they had called my mom and my mom had called me and they said that my mom could come up and get Hazel. And so we ended up going up there and we didn't think that Hazel was going to be put into CPS's care because on the phone, they did not say that to us. And we ended up getting up there to the CPS office and they had said that Hazel was in their care, but they did allow Hazel to go home with my mom. So she was with my mom and my mom and me at that time only lived about 20 minutes away. And so I was always there or Hazel was always here. We had a very close knit bond because I myself, when I was younger, my mom had given me to my grandparents and I didn't exactly know where or who my father was. 
And so I just felt that strong connection with Hazel because I knew what that felt like. And I, and I didn't want Hazel to feel unloved or unworthy or abandoned. And so I really just tried to love her like she was my own. And I have two other daughters that are my biological daughters and they were very close to Hazel too. Hazel was just the sweetest and she always, I mean, for a two, three year old, like she had empathy already. Like she would just, she lit up every room that she walked into. She was always happy, pretty much helping my mom and my dad who had care of her. You know, I was over there all the time or, you know, I'd pick up Hazel and me and Hazel would go have auntie dates with each other and we'd, you know, go to the park or we'd go shopping or, you know, I just, I just really tried to pour everything I could into her because I didn't want her to feel like I felt for so long. She was just like sunshine. Like anybody that, that met her just fell in love with her and she was just so sweet and kind. You know, she had her sassy little moments. But every kid does. And it wasn't like sassy, like, you know, in a bad way. It was just like, you know, she liked to dance. She liked to sing. She, you know, she knew she was cute. (laughs) She knew she was a cutie. She knew how to work it. (laughs) She knew how to work it. Exactly. And one of her favorite things to do was sing and dance. And I'd sing and dance with her. My mom and my dad, they would sing and dance with her all the time. She was just funny. Like sometimes she would... They sent me a picture one time where she ran out and she had pants on top of her head and she was just (laughs) running around the house like that. She was just goofy. She was fun. She wore glasses. When did she start wearing those? I want to say she started wearing them at maybe like two and a half because she had one pair and then she ended up having to get another pair and she got the blue ones because Papa's favorite color was blue. Oh, how cute. And she was really, really close with Papa because when my mom was at work, Papa would be the one that would be there to take care of her until she was able to get into daycare. So she had a really strong bond with Papa and my, and my mom both, but Papa took care of her a lot of the time. I'm telling the story as fairly as I can, but Cammie looks terribly guilty. So there's not much I can do about that. And I'm not here to tell her story. I'm here to tell Hazel's. I appreciate that. No problem. I don't know. I, my brother had her back since the very beginning and I just don't get it. I really don't. He was only with her for like maybe a year, if that. Yeah. It seemed like it wasn't that long. They didn't actually live together, or did they? I mean, she had her own apartment. She had her own apartment because she was on some program with her child. And then my brother had a place in Ferndale, but they pretty much lived together in the Ferndale house. It definitely has been rough on us. But Hazel also kind of going through this brought some people into our lives that we never knew before that have became very close friends of ours. And she's kind of brought our family closer together because, you know, we needed to be there to support one another through all this. I know that Medora's mom never got the chance to meet Hazel. and That's just so sad, but it's great that she was able to be there for her remembrance ceremony. Yeah, she never got the chance to meet Hazel, but she was there and we we all got to meet her at Hazel's memorial. That was the first time that I had ever met her. I do have contact with her here and there. We are Facebook friends. Something was said, I cannot remember where I saw it, that there were photos of Cammie actually showed in the slideshow there at the ceremony. Yes, that was very disturbing for me. And probably for a lot of us that were there, it was really heartbreaking because my brother had control of everything at that memorial and we really couldn't do or say much because we knew that if we did try to say anything or anything like that, that he would be able to just have us thrown out. So we had to walk on eggshells a lot and none of us got to talk about Hazel. It was only him and his friends which I don't want to say that they didn't know Hazel because, you know, she probably had met them before, but 
we were really close to Hazel and to not even be able to have a memorial for her and have to feel like we're walking on eggshells at the one that my brother had for her. And then to see pictures of Cammy and her up on the stage and also pictures of her deceased before they had cremated her. That was a lot. And I was really upset, but again, my brother had the control of that, and I knew that I had to be quiet and maintain myself so that I could be there for Hazel. I had to do that at the hospital, too, and that was even harder. I'm sure. Yeah, you don't want to get kicked out when you're trying to spend those moments with her, that's for sure. Yeah, Hazel definitely gave me the strength to be able to be up at the hospital, and all I kept thinking in my head, no matter how I was treated, You know, having to see Cammie's face, you know, having to deal with all of that. Like, I knew that I needed to be there for Hazel. And Hazel would not want her auntie getting kicked out of the hospital and not being able to be there. And I just had to keep reminding myself. And Hazel was my strength through all of that. I'm sure she's given you a lot of strength. It's been a long process. And you guys had to wait quite a while, too, for the trial to happen. And I'm just glad it's at least that part of it's over for you. Yeah, I am glad that it's over. There was a lot of delays, a lot of emotions. I ended up stopping because I was going up to the court dates, but my brother was there, obviously, and we got in a couple arguments, and I just finally had to make the decision that it was better for me to do it over Zoom because it was hard for me to control myself when I was at court and I was hearing certain things or he was saying certain things after court. And that was really hard because at one point in time, me and my brother were very close. And so I feel like I've lost not only Hazel, but I've also lost my brother. Is he still supporting her, basically? He's still supporting her. He will not have anything to do with his family. He's got his friends up there that he's close with and he pushes his family away and he still supports her and swears that she didn't do it and thinks that the court system and the justice system is wrong. And I thought, I maybe thought that after she was sentenced that maybe it would click in his head that this is, this is real. This is what happened, but nope. Wow. Even after hearing some of those recordings. Yeah, it was hard in the closing arguments. That was probably because I couldn't be at trial except for my testimony. But we did get to go and hear the closing arguments. And that was really, really hard because there were text messages, Facebook messages back and forth from both of them. And he knew. And that's what broke me. You knew. And I sat next to him during one of the closing arguments just so that I could just feel the energy off of him. And I I told him, I said, you knew. There's no way that you didn't know. These messages right here are telling me you knew. You tried to cover it up. And he just started crying. He didn't say nothing. Towards kind of the end, he's like, I loved her. I would have never. And I was like, but you did, bro. Like, there was messages of him saying, oh, I called CPS and I told them that we were out of town. So they said they weren't going to come do a checkup. And there was another message where she's telling him that Hazel's black and blue and looks like she got beat with a stick and laughing, LOL, after it. And all he says is, okay, love you guys. Like, who in their right mind? What explanation did they have for those bruises? I know they're trying to say, you know, after the fact, all of the bruises they found were from medical intervention, etc. But in a message like that, clearly there's something going on and they don't have any, they're not confronted on that, I guess. Yeah, she had said that when those messages were going on, I guess there was a time where she had fallen down the stairs. And when my daughter found the bruises on Hazel in August, my brother had said to my daughter, because my daughter confronted him. She was only 14 at the time, I want to say. She confronted him and asked him. And he had said that they were bruises from slipping out on the rocks and Lummy. Well, when I confronted Cammy, she had told me that Hazel had fallen down cement stairs. Two different stories. And the bruises that my daughter had found looked like finger marks. They did not look like a child had fallen down the stairs. Cement stairs at that. But 
that was their story. And they had control of Hazel at that time. Like me, my mom, everybody, we had to walk on eggshells as soon as they got Hazel in June. And it really seemed like everything was okay. I was able to do a little bit of FaceTime. We were able to talk on the phone in the beginning when she first went there. And then after August, when the bruises got found, they got confronted they started to kind of isolate Hazel away from us. And I was begging, will you please let me just talk to her on the phone? Will you please FaceTime me? I just want to see baby girl, you know, but I had to kiss his butt to get anything from them. And sometimes they just completely ignore me and I'd call and I'd call and I'd call and they would just ignore me. And then Cammie flipped it on that my mom was disrespectful to her And that was why she wasn't getting in the middle and that if we wanted to talk to Hazel, that we needed to go through Brandon while my brother was working all the time. You have Hazel all the time. It was just very unfair. But I never would have imagined that she was being physically abused. I would have went up there and kidnapped her. I wouldn't have cared. That's something that I've really been working on is being able to forgive myself and you know, the regrets that I have that I didn't save her. And that's been really hard. And I just never would have imagined that. You see that stuff on TV. You hear that stuff on podcasts, you know, you don't think that it's your family. Exactly. No, and I feel like that's one of the big reasons that I do this, because a lot of people wouldn't know what signs to look for or, you know, what they could possibly do about it. But the more we tell stories like Hazel's and all these other kids, the more people will absorb this information and be able to intervene if they see something strange happening in their own life. Yeah. And I think that's very important. And I think a lot of times, even the state, they try to sweep it under the rug and act like it, you know, it never happened, make these children's names disappear. And I think that it's amazing and incredible that you don't let that happen that you keep their memory alive and that you bring awareness that child abuse is real and that it can happen in any family. And it's important to recognize this because some people don't know the signs to look for. Like afterwards, I started looking through every picture that they had sent me to see if I could find bruises, see if I could find any marks on her hands, you know, anything I could find. And there was one particular picture where she had her hands closed, but there were like little scab marks on her hand. And when I first looked at the picture in the beginning, when she first sent it to me, I was like, oh, Hazel, look at how cute she looks in her pink dress and her pink headband, you know. But then after all of that happened, I started really looking at the pictures that got sent. And when I noticed that about her hand, I just broke down because I was like, how could I not see that? How could I not notice that on my baby? Like, how how could I not see that? I just feel like it's good that you do these podcasts because it brings awareness and it helps people to know what the signs are and to look for those type of things. I hope you're able to release some of that guilt at some point, because I feel like you and your family loved that little girl more than anyone and would have done anything for her. And like you said, if it took driving up there and kidnapping her, I have no doubt you guys would have done it just to get her out of that situation. So none of this was your fault. There's one person to blame officially. And then, of course, CPS. It happens in every state. And you're right. They do like to try to sweep it under the rug their little review that they did after the fact, the conclusions they came to, I just, I kept scratching my head. Like, that's it. Mm -hmm. So frustrating, but it happens all too often. It really does. And I feel like they get held accountable, but all that really happens is they'll take money from the state. People get settlements or whatever. And, you know, it's not really holding them accountable. There needs to be change. There needs to be reform. And the only way to do it is bring awareness. And if they're just trying to sweep it under the rug all the time, that awareness and that change is not going to happen. And like I've written letters to Congress 
I've been trying to find like representatives that are interested in this and in child abuse and, and interested in how CPS and the state fails these children. And it just amazes me that I haven't really got any answers. I haven't got any answers back other than when I sent the letters to Congress, they sent me a list of who the letter went to, but that's all I got back. And it's like, I'm not going to stop. I, I'm not going to stop because this is close to home for me, but this is not the only child. There are so many more, you know, just as like when I was listening to some of your podcasts, there are so many more that CPS is just dropping the ball on and they're not being held accountable and no change is being brought. And so these kids lives are just gone their memory all of it and there's so many like you said it's not just one state it's not just in america like i heard one of your podcasts from south africa yeah it's everywhere and it's like what is it going to take for them to realize there's something wrong here these are children these are innocent children that don't even get the chance to grow up don't even get the chance to live a life because somebody takes it from them and you don't want to keep their memory alive. I think a huge problem is government immunity. Just the fact that many states don't prosecute, let's say, caseworkers, for example. I know you can't hold them accountable for everything. Some of it's systemic. And then there's the other side of that coin where I am following one in Illinois where the caseworkers were charged, but the charges alone have kept people from going into that profession. So now there's, you know, shortage of caseworkers. It's so hard to find a balance. I, I agree 100%. And I feel that way too. But, you know, I have friends that are CPS caseworkers and they have so much on their plate in so many cases. And it's like, how do you expect one person to be able to do that? I've asked like different CPS workers, what are the things that really are hard for you to be able to do your job? And a lot of the times they say too many cases on one person, too much on their caseload. They feel like they don't have the support that they should. And there is not a collective system of mental health and like things like that that is like at their reach. Right. They need to be able to offer resources to these people. Yes. And I know the one lady who took over Hazel's case, the last one, because she had three caseworkers, but the last one, it said that she had the highest caseload of her whole department, which right there, that's your problem. Staffing shortages are hard to overcome, but there's got to be something that can be done to alleviate that. Yeah, I agree. And that's kind of why, like, part of me, like, I'm so angry and, and frustrated. And I do believe that CPS needs to be held accountable but I also believe that they need to make changes. And one of them is lowering that caseload. How is somebody going to be able to check in and be responsible and be able to really thoroughly do their job when they have so much on their caseload? They can't go to every single house like they're supposed to. And I think another thing that needs to happen is, and you know, some people may disagree with me. But I don't feel like they should tell them days in advance, hey, I'm coming to your house to check on this kid. Right. So they can clean everything up and make sure that the, the kid doesn't have any bruises outside their clothes. And it's just so silly. It, if you're doing a health and safety visit, it should be drop in and say hello. Yep. I agree with you. Some of it makes absolutely no sense. And the woman who had Hazel's case had, I think, 24 families she had to stay on top of. I can't imagine... How do you keep your workload straight when you're, I know, I think she was the one that Stephanie had mentioned felt badly and, and teared up on the stand when she was testifying. And I can imagine, you know, being responsible for a family where something like this happens, it must just destroy you. Yeah. Like you said, it's systemic because, you know, like you said, on the other hand, there are other caseworkers that completely drop out of it because they just feel like, it's too much. They want to be there. They want to help. They want to do their job correctly. But with as much as they put on them, it's better to step themselves out and find something else to do because they mentally and physically can't keep up with that. 24 families on one caseload. That's insane. Yeah. I do have empathy for the caseworkers. I do feel like they're underpaid and overworked. 
And, you know, there are some that I know that really do have the heart for what they do, but they're giving them impossible situations that they have to deal with. And it goes back to the government. It goes back to the money. It goes back to what they can get out of it and how much money they can save. It's horrible. Those are, those are kids' lives. Those are, you know, they didn't ask to be here. They're people. They might be smaller, but they're people. and They deserve the same protections that the rest of us have. It is so frustrating. And, and then the, the reunification part of it, where they try to save money by not having a child in foster care. So stick them back with their parents. It's just, that's not always the best. It's just not. Some people just shouldn't have children. I agree. The reunification is really like ever since then, because I've been doing my research, I've been looking into things ever since they really came up with that reunification. There has been more child abuse more children being murdered than there was before. They need to have like a trial period or something where they put these kids into these homes. But at that point in time, they need to make sure that that caseworker doesn't have 24 caseloads so that they can really check in on these children and make sure that they're being taken care of and they're protected. I mean, I work now as a visit supervisor I'm subcontracted. I do not work for CPS and DSHS, but I now am a visit supervisor and I go into homes and I go into DCYF offices and I do visitation during these times because I want to be the eyes and the ears and the voice. That's awesome. Yeah. I was a domestic violence sexual assault advocate for about a year and a half after the situation with Hazel. And now I'm a visit supervisor and I'm there to protect those kids. But if they want to reunite parents, one thing that I've really learned doing this is that many of those parents come from different environments where they were not even given the opportunity to learn how to be parents. Right. They do need services for sure. Yes. They need some kind of mentor or something that they can also get the help that they need, you know, so that they can learn how to be a parent to that child. Right. They don't always have the best role models and sometimes they just need education, yes. maybe be anchor management or treatment. Yeah, exactly. Mental health treatment, addiction treatment, but they should all have it available to them. And it all comes down to how much are we willing to spend to protect kids? And I mean, really protect them to make sure that the people caring for them are equipped to do it. Yeah, I agree. And that's one of the biggest things that I've seen. So even though my job is a visit supervisor and I'm there to protect those kids, I do have two caseloads where I work with these parents. I used to be a DVSA advocate, so I do have resources. I do have knowledge of certain things. So I have been able to help them along the way and help them to get routines down and figure out what's going to work for them, helping them to get mental health services, helping them to try to find shelters if they're in a domestic violence situation, like just being able to have that background in DV and SA, it's really helped me to be able to help them. And I think that they should be given those services in the first place. And I think that the youth should be able to have mentors too. It needs to be a collective thing. It's not just one person or the other. Like that's, and it is hard to find that balance because if you swing too much one way, you're done for, you know, and that's what's been so hard. And like, the research and everything is like, where are we going to find that balance? But I do think that giving the parents that opportunity is going to be beneficial, not only for the parent, but it's going to be beneficial for the child. It's going to be beneficial for the child's safety. And then also with the reunification, there are parents that don't even want to be parents and they're trying to force them. They're trying to force them to be parents. They're trying to force them to be there for their visits. And what happens? You take the child to their visit. Their parent doesn't want to be a parent. So that parent doesn't show up to the visit. That child's heartbroken. It does more damage to that child for them to force parents who do not want to be parents. And that's the other thing that I've seen. And it's like, why do that? Because then you're going to reunite them and they're not even going to want that child. And that has happened. I just did a story about a little boy like that a few weeks ago and his dad didn't want him, but his mom went to prison and they were just hell bent on your son's going with you. And then look what happened. He ends up on my podcast. I, I wish to God I didn't have to tell his story. You know, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't. And I've watched parents. I've heard parents out their mouth say, I'm not ready to be a parent. I don't want to be a parent. 
Why are you forcing them? It's their loss. If they don't want to be a parent and you're forcing them and you're going to reunite them back into that family, like you said, it can end in child abuse, neglect, malnutrition, all these things. You're damaging that child more. And all they're trying to do is save money because once they get back with that parent. Right. They don't have to pay the foster family anymore. Yep. I've been talking about for quite some time, you know, there needs to be a coalition of family members like yourself. And I, I can think of 50 others off the top of my head that I would want to get involved. We kind of have it in a sort of a infancy stage right now, but we want to kind of try to get these people together and talk about what really needs to change as far as laws, as far as CPS and from all different states, because like you said before, it's it's everywhere. And you'd be one of the people I would want to speak up it's so important that these kids have their voices and we're all they have left, you know? Yeah, I would definitely be willing to do that. I would love to do that, you know, bring that awareness, get those people together that have actually really experienced the loss of a loved one because of the state, because of these laws that they bring forth. And it all has to do, it's all systemic and it all has to do with the money that they're going to save. I mean, there's foster parents that are like, if they don't want to have their child, like, let us adopt them. Let us take care of them. Let us keep fostering them. And they have a certain amount of time. And if not, then they're trying to send them to a family member in Texas that they've never met in their life. They're trying to send them to a family member in Los Angeles that they've never met in their life. There's no transition. There's no bringing the foster parent down there to transition the child. No, it's literally them bringing that child to Los Angeles to meet these people that they've never met before in their life. That does more damage to a child. And then they'd start acting out and, and ups the chance that they'll be abused as well. You know, it's yep. it's an ugly cycle. It, there's so many places we can intervene. You just have to stick the monkey wrench into the machinery at a certain spot. And there's so many spots. I just feel like there's so much we can do and, and so much that needs to be done. And it's just a matter of figuring out who's going to do it and how and how we can amplify people like you, your voices, so that everyone will hear and pay attention. Yeah, because it's hard when you try to do it yourself. And it can be very discouraging. Like when you write letters about, you know, losing your niece to murder and child abuse because the system failed them and not hearing anything back. I mean, I could go and stand at our Capitol here and stand out there with a sign. And you know how many people are just going to walk by me are not even going to pay attention. But if you unite people and you get the people that have experienced it, you get the people that want to be the voice for their loved one, then maybe they'll hear you. But you get yourself out there and you try to be that voice. A lot of times it can be very discouraging, but I will not give up. I will keep fighting. I will yell. Hazel has a lot of Hazel warriors behind her. That's what we call ourselves is Hazel warriors. And there's a lot of us. And I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to give up. This isn't just about Hazel. This is about the many other children that they try to leave unnamed. And it'll continue to happen until, like you said, we all get together and we stand up and we speak up so that they can't just ignore us. That's it. You just have to be the loudest. And the more voices you get, the more loud you can be. I know there are some parents I've talked to and, and aunts. Um, I'm thinking of a couple of, of aunts and cousins right now who have actually had laws changed. So people like that as well, who kind of know, where did I start? How did I do it? They're important to talk to as well. Change can happen and it will happen if you talk to the right people and if you tell them loud enough. Yeah, um, I actually met a woman off of TikTok in Texas. She's an aunt and she got some laws changed. The grandparents got some laws changed, but she also got some laws changed. And right now she is working on getting a child abuse registry started. I mean, if we can have a sexual predator registry in every state, that's the one thing I've always wondered. I mean, I know it's about people's privacy, but at some point, when does the child's safety become more important than the adult's privacy? Yep. I do know one woman who's working on something similar. She's passed a couple of laws in Virginia already for her niece, but she's trying on a national level to get a law passed about a registry. That would be awesome. Yeah, I've been talking to her a lot because 
this happened with their niece, I want to say 11 years ago. And she's already got some laws passed. And she's kind of helping me because I've never went through this. I never in a million years thought I would go through anything like this. So I don't even know where to start. She's really been helping me. And, you know, she's telling me this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. And that when she told me that the other night, I was like, okay, I I get it. This is going to take some time. It's not going to happen overnight, but you don't give up. I'll take a break here for one final word from my sponsors. I feel like Hazel would be so proud of you for persevering. And I feel like she's definitely the strength for all of you to keep pushing. She sends me little signs all the time. Some of her signs are ladybugs and white feathers. I always called her hazel bug or my bug. And so, yeah, ladybugs was the thing. And the feathers, um, <laughs> when I went to court for the closing arguments, I was outside and I kept seeing like little white feathers. And I'm like, hazel. I need something bigger. I need something that I can rub because I that just helps calm me. I'm like, I need something bigger, Hazel. And I started to head back in towards the door and there was this big, big white feather. It had a little bit of silver in it, but it was a big white feather. And I took that in the courtroom with me and that was what I did. I just rubbed that feather and I thought of Hazel. Sometimes I would think of Hazel sitting on my lap so that I couldn't get up or I couldn't freak out. And so I would just think of Hazel just sitting on my lap and I would just rub that feather. And like Hazel knew, Hazel knew exactly what Auntie needed in that moment. And she gave it to me. She does that a lot. <laughs> she does that a lot. She's keeping an eye out for you and I do feel like she'd be incredibly proud of you for everything you're doing and keeping her name out there. Thank you. I'm I'm trying. I really am trying. Well, I will do anything I can to help to wrap up. Do you want to tell us a few things about Hazel that you remember, the things that you loved about her? Yeah. Hazel loved to dance and sing, like I said. Um, one of our big things was she really loved the movie Moana. And that was one of our things. We just sit there and watch the movie Moana. And there's a song, How Far I'll Go. And that was our song. Like she, we would just sit on the bed and we would sing that together. I also have a video of her. She loved Baby Shark song. <laughs> and so I, I, you know, I have videos of that of her. And she was just always so happy. Like that's why when I started seeing and listening to the things that were in the closing arguments, it just broke me down because it was the abuse, yes, but just her going around and asking people if they loved her. Like Hazel never, ever, ever had to question if she was loved by any of us. Never. So to know that she felt unworthy and unloved and unsafe and fearful. It just broke me down so bad. It was never like that with us. She was always happy. Like she would barely even get upset and cry. Like she was just always happy running around, playing with my kids, dancing, singing. Like she was just like pure joy all the time. And like I said in the beginning, when I was little, that was the one thing I didn't want her to feel unloved. I didn't want her to feel unworthy. I didn't want her to feel abandoned. And so knowing that before she passed on, that's what she felt just breaks me down. But there was something that is really special about Hazel's story. Even though Cammie did the things that she did to Hazel that were horrific, God still was able to use Hazel to save three other people's lives that Christmas. Hazel was able to donate her heart her kidneys, and her liver. And a little boy got her heart. And I actually got a letter from their family last year. She was an angel baby from birth. And knowing that God was able to take something 
that was meant to be evil and destroy our family, God was able to take that and make something beautiful out of it and help save the lives of two other children and one other young male. That was something so special that I could hold on to through all of this is that everything that the enemy meant for evil, God was able to bring good into that. And God is really in my faith and all of that is really also what has kept me going. And before all of this happened, I was going to school because I thought I wanted to be an RN. And after everything, I switch now and I'm going for my bachelor's in social work. And my passion and everything has came to me. Like she has, everything that she ended up enduring, God was able to turn it into something good. And when everything happened and we were at the hospital and they had pronounced her, I never prayed so hard in my life. I was on my knees and I was praying, praying, praying just for her to breathe. And she got no response. And so when they pronounced her, I flipped out. I lost myself. I went downstairs and I was just freaking out. And God told me, God was like, something good is going to come out of this. You're going to do something in honor of Hazel. And Hazel is going to help others. There's something good that's going to come out of this. And I really had to hold on to that through this whole two and a half years of fighting. And, you know, and the fight's not over. But I've I've seen so much good come out of something that the enemy meant for evil. And that's just who Hazel was, too. She was just always such just... A miracle. She was always just such sunshine. And to know that her legacy lives on and those three people that she helped save their lives, that just makes it even better. It really hurts that we had to sacrifice, but to know that she was able to save the lives of three other people with her one life. She's a hero. She is. She really is. She really is a hero. And her middle name was Journey. Her name was Hazel Journey Holman. And her journey is not over. Far from it. It's amazing. There's part of her walking around right now. And these people have your family to thank for it. It is powerful. Yeah. That's been a big part of her story that you don't really see that in the courts. I did say that in the impact because I did an impact statement at the sentencing. And I did say I didn't want to give credit to Cami for this, but that is such a huge part of Hazel's story and such a huge part of how God works. Something that was meant to even destroy me has set my soul on fire and set me into my passion and what I feel is my purpose. And I'm walking by faith because I have no idea exactly what he wants me to do. But just walking by faith, I get piece by piece. And Hazel is literally right there holding my hand, guiding me every step of the way. I think you're right. I don't get teared up often during these conversations, but you got me. (laughs) That's incredible. I, I really hope that whatever it is that I, God's going to do, I really hope that it honors Hazel and it helps all the other innocent little children that don't deserve to go through what Hazel went through. I have to keep that faith. You know, my faith is what gets me by and it's been rough and there have been times where I've been mad at God because of all of it, but I just feel Hazel with me, and I just know that she's just, come on, Auntie, come on, Auntie, I'll show you the way. So I just have to keep following her, and she gives me signs to let me know she's right there. It certainly is inspiring that you're able to keep going that way and just keep following her little voice. What would you say is your favorite memory of her? There's so many, (laughs) like, there's so many, but like one of the biggest ones is just dancing and singing with her and sitting on the bed and watching Moana with her in my arms and just seeing really a lot of singing and dancing. She always, she loved music. 
her papa loved music too. Grandma loved music, but she just loved music. And also when she was in the hospital, because they kept her on the ventilator and everything because we were donating her organs. So when she was in the hospital, everybody had left. I don't know where they all went. They were probably downstairs or whatever. And it was kind of the middle of the night. And I was able to go in there with her. And I had her little Moana doll. And I set it down next to her bed. And I was able to talk to her. And I put the movie on. And we sat there. And I watched that movie. And I sang to her. And I just felt like she knew that I needed that. That I needed that closure to be able to say goodbye. And one of our favorite times together was watching that movie. And it was just, I don't even know how everybody was gone. I don't even know where they were, but I just had that time with her. And I know that she knew that I needed that. She knew that I needed to be able to have that one last time with her because that was something that we did together that I held close as a memory. And I got to give her a bath and I got to paint her nails and her toes and braid her little hair. And one day me and my sister Kelsey were able to do that too. And that was, that was really good. But when she was alive and well, I mean, there were so many. I can't just think of one because we were always together. I do the picture where she has the yellow flower and the stick in her hand. We took her before she had went back with Brandon. It was, I want to say maybe a month before, but it was right after we found out that she was going to end up going back up to Bellingham. We have this area that's out here where I live and there's like water out there and you can go down there. There's shells and stuff like that, rocks. And we took her there. It was just me, my hubby and our two kids. Oh, and the dog. We had the dog with us and we took her there and she had so much fun. She played in the water. She, you know, and in that picture, she was like, Auntie, look. And she was holding that flower and that stick. I have another picture where I took and she was behind me and she just was smiling. But that was another really good memory of ours was just spending that day together, just playing in the water, playing in the grass and just being able to be together. But there are honestly so many memories, like going to the park with her. She loved to go to the park and play on the swings and the slide. Papa always would take her to the park because when grandma and papa lived in, when they first ended up getting her, they lived like literally across the street from a school. And so she loved to go over to that school and go play in the park and the playground. There was just so many memories with her. She was just so special, so loving. Oh, another good one. It was her third birthday and she wanted a strawberry chocolate swirled cake i'm not a cake maker i'm not a cake decorator and i actually have this picture because i have a hazel wall at my house and it has hazel in the middle and then it's got all the pictures i made the cake and it was chocolate strawberry swirl and it tasted amazing and the outside of it was pink strawberry frosting and i didn't really have anything that i could find that was like moana so I found this like cardboard because it was kind of like last minute, but I found this cardboard Moana picture and I wrote happy B-Day bug. And then I had like real strawberries and I put real strawberries on there. And then I had Skittles or maybe they were M&Ms. I'm looking at the picture right now trying to figure <laughs> out what they were, but it was kind of hideous. Like it was not the prettiest <laughs> cake at all. And as soon as she seen that cake, she just lit up. She had her hands up by her face and she just had her mouth open and just thought it was the most amazing thing. And right in that moment, I was like that just pure innocence of children 
before the world has corrupted them or done, you know, like they've got the effects of the world, just that like pure, innocent joy. Like if I would have showed that to like, you know, maybe my like older kid or something, they'd be like, whoa, that's really messed up cake. But Good one, mom. <laughs> yeah, like nice one, mom. Thanks for the cake, you know, but like she was so little and so young. It was just like, her face just lit up and she was just so happy and it had Moana on it. That's all she wanted. That's all she wanted. And it was strawberry chocolate swirl, just like she wanted. You could just see her just joy and just her pure innocence. And that that's just how she was. Like she was just always so happy and just full of joy and just smiling all the time. And like we'd always take selfies together. I'm so happy that I took as many pictures <laughs> as I did. I wish I could have got more videos with her, but I took a lot of pictures and selfies with her making weird faces or, <laughs> you know, that was like one of our things. And now... I think back and I'm like, you know what? I'm so happy I did that because you just never know and you never think that that's all you're going to have left. You wouldn't think that like a child really had empathy, you know, but it was like she knew if you were sad or if you were mad, she would come over and be like, what's wrong, auntie? <laughs> or if I was like sad, if she could feel it, she'd just give me the biggest bear hug. And it wasn't just me. She did it for everybody. She just knew. And she would just come up and hug you. And it was just like pure sunshine. Like it would just take whatever you were feeling. It would just take it away. And you would be in that moment with that pure innocent child. Thank you so much to both Stephanie and Ashley for taking the time to talk with me. I always love talking with family members who keep these kids' memories alive with every story they tell about them and every memory they share. It was also fascinating talking with Stephanie about her experience in the courtroom and how the evidence in the case brought the jury to their conclusions. Rest well, Hazel. You'll never be forgotten. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.